announcements right now. And uh, and then the food will be here probably the next, I don't know, five minutes. And uh, oh, okay. Yeah, we can definitely get you more. <laughs> Hey, are we live right now on the stream? Yes, we're live. Huh? Check it. Check it. Is this thing on? Can you hear me? Live stream, here we go. There we go. All right. Uh, food should be here in about five minutes. So we're going to go ahead and make a couple quick announcements, and then hopefully by the time we're done with our round of announcements, uh, the food will be here. Uh, Tim is going to come up and uh, give us a quick word about some cool stuff that's going on at CoLab, right? Yep. Indeed. All right. Everybody give it up for Tim. I should be on. Bloop, bloop. Cool. I did not expect applause because I was just going to make a quick announcement. Hey. Come over oh. here. Live stream, right. Yeah, live stream. Okay, there you go. Hey, so like you said, I work at the collab downstairs. Um, we haven't actually made a huge uh, public announcement on it on social media because we're still waiting on a couple things to get approved for it. But on March 29th, Tuesday, March 29th, here in a couple of weeks at 5.30 right here in this room, we're going to have an event called Reverse Pitch. Um, I don't know if any of you were there at the last one for our 2014 Reverse Pitch. It was during Startup Week. But what Reverse Pitch is basically we're going to have some organizations get up here and pitch an actual problem that they're facing. Uh, there's a couple involving education as far as how... Uh, like opportunities to use VR technology in education, um, even talking about like streaming 4K microscopes, um, opportunities in education. Uh, EPB is going to be presenting uh, an opportunity to be working with, um, sorry, it's like I'm trying to like read it in my spreadsheet here. EPB is going to be presenting an opportunity for like creating an incentives program for using power at non-peak times. Um, so anyway, a lot of this presents opportunities for developers, and there is some funding opportunities with those. Uh, there's going to be more information coming up actually probably later today, but if that's something that interests you, um, go to colab.co. It's going to be right there on our front page. You can access all the information. All of the uh, reverse pitches will be listed on there, and you guys can RSVP. So thanks for giving me a second to talk to you guys. Give it back to Brett. Thanks, Tim. Round of applause. Hmm. All right. Uh, yes. Richard. DevOps. Thank you. DevOps. Thank you. No applause? Come on. Round of applause, okay, thank people. You, thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, DevOps. Uh, I'll be here all lunch, and I'll be back next Tuesday evening, which is what this is about. The meetup for CHA DevOps, and we're a satellite DevOps. We're a uh, satellite of the uh, CHA Dev, you know, franchise. Uh, we're having our, our uh, March, this is March, uh, meetup for DevOps, and we're going to switch and, and, and not be in this community space, but we're switching back to the orange room back there, also known as the conference room, so we can have a table to sit around and get more involved in what we're doing. What we're going to do on Tuesday night is a Docker show and tell, so if you want to come and find out about Docker more and actually see it done, or if you do Docker, you know, come and spend 15 minutes showing what you do. What I plan to do is uh, have an Ansible playbook that will spin up some Docker instances in somebody's cloud. So uh, we'll, we'll play with that Tuesday night, uh, 6 o'clock in the Orange Room. Thanks. All right. So any other announcements you need to make? Tonight, right here, uh, we're going to be here for the Elixir meetup. So if that sounds like fun to you, you should come. Um, if you don't know what that is, you should come and learn about it. I uh, might have a good time. So uh, we'll be here. Uh, you can check meetup.com, Chattanooga Elixir. Uh, we're, gonna, we're working on some, some problem sets from uh, Rosalind. So uh, check that out. Um, food should be here, just real, real short. So you guys uh, just take a minute, a few minutes just to uh, chill out, and we'll get kicked off here in just a second. Cool. Don't be so quiet. Uh. 
Uh, test, one, two, three. Oh, yeah, that's, that's something is better. All right. Don't you mind if I'll start a little bit, you know, to chat with the, with the group and, you know, I'll try to understand, like, why you guys here and, like, what you're going to, you know. Let me usually. just say a few words. Yeah, so yeah. Um, Victor uh, flew down from New York today. Um, so long way and then drove up from Atlanta. So give him a round of applause for that. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. Um, and, yeah, so he's going to talk to us a little bit about the kind of stuff that, that he does in sort of broad terms and, Maybe uh, tell us a little bit about um, Hazelcast, the company that he works for. And uh, we also want to give it up for Hazelcast today because they are uh, providing you all with lunch. So give a round of applause for Hazelcast. Yay. Thank you very much. Um, there is, if you haven't signed up, there's a raffle uh, on the back table here um, going on. They're giving away some, some cool gear, a gift card, and a uh, really sweet thermos. Um, and they've got some cool free swag, some, some, some uh, stickers. stickers and pins yeah. and whatnot. And I have uh, some samples of some stickers here. You can have this guy. I'm not sure <laughs> if you do have this guy. You know, lots of stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I believe uh, Victor's going to have some T-shirts to give away for. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, sweet uh, participation. Uh, yeah, exactly. All right, everybody, give it up for Victor. Right. Um, thank you guys. Um, it's nice to be here. Uh, hello online. We're in line here. Okay. So. Um, so first of all, I'll, I'll try to understand like why you guys here, um, and you know what's uh, what's your thing. Just give me a second. My presenter will. Uh... All right. So why are you here? So this is like a typical thing that people who cares about the people who you speak um, tries to understand first, right? Like why people will care about this particular presentation and why they will come to listen. So first of all, because I'm talking mostly about the Java ecosystems and you know, in the past I was a JavaScript guy, I will mention this a little bit, but I got back to a sweet spot of, on Java and um, I like to talk to Java developers. So how many of you here Java developers that's struggling with uh, scalability? Guys, come on, Java. So in this case, I'm uh, you know, closing this stuff up and uh, not going to do anything else because pretty much all this stuff would be about Java. No, I'm just joking. So this is going to be a, a very generic talk, even though the product is Java. Whoa. We good? All right. Okay, online. We're back online. All right, internet. Okay, Java developers. Um, so most cases, the Java benefits will uh, Java developers will benefit more, but it's not the it's not the point because we have a multiple goodies for other people. Like okay, so Java, no Java here. Okay, so what's here? C sharp. Good. Uh, C plus plus. Good, some, some of the people. Uh, JavaScript. All right, no JS, right? No JS? Okay, good. Python. Sweet. Now we're on the right place. Anyways, I found the people I can uh, at, le at least. Um, <coughs> I uh, now I know how to approach you. All right. So now, the, do we have any architects here? I'm a, a solutions architect, so I can consider myself as an architect. Yeah, at some point. Architects, nice. So the architects that are seeking for low latency uh, solutions for like some uh, next big thing. All right, so NoSQL guys. 
Mongo, Ryak, uh, what else? Uh, the uh, Redis, oh, who said Redis? All right, I will talk to you about this later. <laughs> um, next, uh, who knows about AMD, uh, AMDG before this talk? Who heard about this term, these four letters? This is awesome. I'm in the right place because after this talk, you will be certified IMDG newbie. So you will know the things to, to, to continue discussion about IMDG and you know, you will know what's the difference between AMDG and AMDB. That's cool. And uh, data guys, like uh, data researchers, big data guys. Couple, nice, they're still, they're still good. So we have like a little bit of uh, the different guys here. This is very nice. And this is why this talk was prepared to be generic. All right. So look, a couple of words about myself. So who knows this guy? So who can tell me who, who is this guy? Played in the Rocky movie. Yeah. Exactly. This is actor Dolph Lundgren. It's a known fact. And he played in the Rocky Four movie. A Russian guy. Known fact. Unknown fact. Dolph Lundgren has the major... Uh, master degree in uh, in chemical engineering. Exactly, he is actually a very smart guy. His his IQ is like uh, over the top. Close enough. All right. So, <laughs> I work as a solutions architect in in Hazelcast. This is work uh, I enjoy to do. This is how I envision this work. I'm just you know struggling with some difficult stuff with very heavy heavy things. Uh, I'm, I'm, this is kind of thing that I enjoy to do. So I'm talking to the conferences, and as you can see from my stickers from my laptop, I've been in different places. And uh, uh, because I'm in a group of friends, I can confess for some shames. I was uh, responsible for JavaScript book. Um, actually, this is a very good book because in, in this book, we try to put some of our knowledge about enterprise development, how, um, how real enterprise applications need to be structured. We talk about modularized, uh, modu modules in JavaScript. We're talking about the testing in JavaScript. We're talking about like, how to bring the, this, this new project to your boss and explain him how JavaScript application needs to be written in 2015, 2016 um, without all this like a GSP and uh, ASP and uh, other things, all right? Okay, so the quick agenda for today. Uh, I'll talk to you, or I will um, explain the landscape uh, where the, the in-memory technologies right now in this particular day, um, how we position ourselves. I'm, I'm saying about myself because I work for the company that um, um, in the field of in-memory data grid product. Um, so we, we, I will talk about how this application can be applicable in, in the real world. Um, and uh, because sometimes people think if it's in memory, it cannot be durable or it cannot be scalable or it cannot provide a desirable level of uh, resiliency. So I'll try to uh, address this as well. And after that, I would love to hear some questions from you guys. Would be nice. So why is in memory? Why today? Why it is important? And why, you know, we, the, the founders of our company, they designed our, this product in 2008. So what's the problem we're trying to solve? So usually, um, in most cases, um, this is applicable to mostly in Java. However, in, in your languages, in your, um, um, in your uh, the problem field, you might see the similarities. So, when application runs in, uh, in Java, it runs inside the, uh, the container called Java Virtual Machine. And Java Virtual Machine essentially is a sandbox. It's, uh, it limits resources, uh, especially RAM, and allows you to um, do not like, go beyond this. So in this case, you have a control over resources. You can do better planning of resources, etc. So the heap itself, it's a very nice place because heap, it's actually, um, it's, it's actually memory, it's, it's a RAM, and all your application running there. And it's fast because it's in RAM. It doesn't touch a disk. It doesn't need to spin this like gears inside the disk. It doesn't need to go to network and you know, fetch something over there. It doesn't need to go to database to go through all this uh, query plan, etc. So it's very fast. It's, it, it runs inside usually 
um, um, it's maybe typical key value pattern for accessing this data, like a typical maps, or it might be um, some of the database-like uh, structures that allow you to do uh, queries on, on this in memory structures. However, this is the limit. Uh, if you want to go beyond this limit in terms of like putting more data plus more code inside in it, you need to think about different solutions. So you need to you need to move. Uh, your application uh, to disk to persist some data, talk to database, talk to network, talk to different systems. So, and thing is that if uh, we increase in number, uh, we increase in the, the amount of, um, of data that we store in it, we actually introducing more latency because we starting collecting latency over the layer from one layer to another. When we're jumping from one layer to another, we're getting more and more um, different latency. It's like, this is very like approximation, but it gives you like very good idea. So usually people not storing like uh, uh, hundreds of gigabytes inside, inside this. I have this signal that food has arrived. So you can, I can continue talking. You can come to grab the food or I can pause for five minutes. You can, con you can grab the food uh, and you will be eating and I will be talking, all right? Pause, okay, yeah, okay, that's, that's fine.
Check, check, check. All right, guys, we're gonna we're gonna kick off round two here. It's a roll. Yeah, warm it back up. Give a round of applause for Victor. Warm that back up. Come on, there you go. No, enjoy your food. All right. Enjoy your food. Um, all right. Now, so the problems that I try to explain is not the singular. It's not uh, uh, related to uh, relate, uh, related to just one machine. Now, when we put this problem into perspective, right? Um, like this, like it's a very enterprise slide. I don't know, like, uh, <laughs> but I couldn't find another way to, 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 to demonstrate enterprise architecture without enterprise slide. Um, so many, that kind of applications run inside many virtual machines. And when you put in this problem into that kind of scale, additional uh, uh, problems with um, latency with uh, network partition and other things might cause tremendous problems into applications. And specifically when we design applications um, for, G for JVM, for any, any VM, my, I, I'm pretty sure uh, .NET has similar things um, in, um, in, their, um, in their trunk. So we need to, we need to think about how our code runs, not on a physical machine, but how it runs inside VM. After that, we also need to know the good understanding how it runs to, um, down to the hardware to see like what, where the problem can arise and the, how, how we can scale application in this case, how we can um, fix and how we uh, provide more, how we bring more users to our application at scale. And we're going to, to deep, deeper, deeper in the different aspects of the system. We're talking about uh, database. When we're talking about database, we need to think about resiliency. We, uh, resiliency, we need to talk about um, database scalability or database replication. Um, at some point, uh, replication might not work or a solution will be too expensive. You need to rethink about this. Maybe use NoSQL solution that allows you to do a uh, different kind of thing that relational database does, etc. And now in today, in today's world, like we, we're, not, we're not thinking about like one, the singular, the tiny instance of application. We think about the use case. We think about particular business field. We think about um, how we can, application can serve um, millions of uh, devices like cell phones and smartphones. How we can uh, integrate this not only with enterprises like fat clients, but also how to, we can integrate with um, the, the thin clients, including browsers, etc., And it should be some, some sort of universal transfer solution, right? And it is, you know, my point today, I'm trying to explain how I think that AMDG can be this universal transfer solution and help to overcome the kind of problems that was uh, emphasized uh, earlier. So in terms of landscape. Now, I want to, sometimes people are asking, like, what's the difference between Hazelcast and Redis? What's the difference between Memcache and Hazelcast? What's the difference between Mongo and Memcache, etc.? cetera? And we, we essentially, people are trying to the, the compare different types of the product that intend to be solving similar use cases because the, the, for a particular use case, different products are interchangeable. So this is why people think, okay, uh, how I can use in-memory database Redis to do caching or uh, instead of memcache with in-memory key value store, uh, essentially also in-memory database, or how I can run um, computation or message queue on Mongo. You can do this, uh, but is it right tool to, to solve this kind of problem? And um, I'll, I'll talk about this in, uh, <coughs> in, in this slide, basically. So the biggest thing, every application Serious, serious application, enterprise grade application, never work without uh, database. And today, like it you or, you or you don't like it, we still depend on the technology that was designed 35 years ago. I wasn't even born there that time. Um, and this technology is the uh, relational technology, relational math, and uh, uh, relational database is still here. And they fighting back with all these new 
technologies like NoSQL and stuff. So this is why NoSQL, uh, SQL, to, uh, SQL databases is still here and still they getting like a big chunk of, of market, of, of usage. Now, another very important component of distributed systems is message middleware. It can be a open source thing like uh, ActiveMQ, uh, Re uh, Rabbit uh, RabbitMQ, um, some enterprise-like solutions like uh, Microsoft MQ, IBM MQ, etc. Some of these, um, many of these uh, solutions, they provide some sort of integration to with relational databases, so this is why I'm putting here to overlap them, because sometimes they're providing durability capabilities and allow you to persist contents of the queues and topics into the relational databases. Uh, in memory computing technologies, um, they still um, very new, I would say, in, uh, in uh, overall uh, landscape of technology. So in memory computing, um, uh, the, the different frameworks that allow you to, to do some, some computation are uh, also interchanged because they can use the uh, message middleware uh, type of things to, 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 to talk to components or to read data from one component and write it to another component. Uh, SQL databases usually use as a source of the data, so we can also put in here. And as I already said, uh, even though uh, we still have um, NoSQL, uh, the SQL databases, NoSQL databases for a couple past years ate like big chunk of market of usage because the people like simplicity, they, they really understand their use case, they don't really need to think in relational format and um, we're gonna talk about um, non-relational kind of things for in-memory databases uh, and in-memory data grids. And from, from perspective of uh, position of in-memory data grid, we think we're somewhere in between. We still, it's a growing market. Um, there are not so many the vendors right now. It's like you can name it like leading vendors, like maybe five or six uh, leading vendors in this, in this technology. But in-memory data grids, they actually providing very similar uh, capabilities that other well-known product already providing for you. So in-memory data grids provide the messaging capabilities, in-memory data grids provide uh, in-memory computing capabilities. Um, it provides capabilities of uh, NoSQL databases with the key value type of approach, and also they can provide um, SQL with structured queries, so you can always access not only with key value, but also using some queries. And uh, uh, when, I, when I talk about the um, um, overall, okay. so let me ask you a question. Who disagrees? Who does disagree with this uh, slide and uh, has the, the different opinion about the, the thing? I wanna have conversation here instead of lecture. So you can actually, when you're done with your lunch, I see many of you already done, so you can start you know, asking questions and trying to get one of these awesome t-shirts. Uh, all right. So applications. Uh, when I said uh, when I said like uh, different d different the products that I mentioned in previous slides can be used in you can interchange them for solving particular use case. This is a couple of use cases that very common for many uh, solutions in MDG world. So biggest use case that people use in memory grids and in memory databases is in caching because it's in memory, it's stored result of previous computation or it's stored result of a previous query that we get from the database and we don't wanna get to database very often. We can read it from cache very quickly. Since uh, the cache is very natural use case and uh, sort of uh, in memory grids they provide, with the name, they provide this scalability out of the box, um, application scalability so it can, can, be, can be achieved. So now you're running your application uh, and your, your application serves hundreds of users. Now your load on your application increases because you bring your, your sales guide 
uh, brought you new clients. So now you need to think how you can scale same application. So the, 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 the problem with increase, increased uh, usage will not um, cause the problem to your business. Now, the application scalability is very important. And many components of the memory grids, they actually embeddable. So instead of like having separate uh, in memory grid cluster to do the thing, you can actually embed the components inside your application. So your application essentially can be um, instance of the grid. And because the, 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 it, it will be embedded, all the things like distributed cache, distributed uh, other structures, for example, you need to do distributed um, coordination. So you need to, you know that only one instance of application can get access to one uh, shared resource at a time. So you need to think about distributed locking, right? Some, 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 some sort of distributed locking mechanism. You can use uh, uh, some of the solutions, but uh, in-memory grids allow you to embed this com component in, in your application, and your application would be essentially um, include this feature out of the box. So application scalability. Uh, database caching, it's a, it's a very, it's, it's a basically subset of the cache as a service. Cache as a service allow you to integrate different heterogeneous sources, database, mainframe, NoSQL database, web service. Uh, database caching is particular use case for, for caching slow queries. For, for example, in Java, we have this framework called Hibernate that uh, provides the object relational mapping between uh, Java objects and, uh, and uh, database tables. And um, the Hibernate has this concept uh, of um, layered caching. There is a first, la uh, uh, first level uh, cache and the second level cache. So first level cache is basically it stores uh, some of the result in, uh, um, when you have the, the, the connection to the database. Second level cache actually can store a result of some queries. And um, to, 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 to sort of integrate with this framework and provide the, the, the capabilities. Hazelcast, for example, it can, it can be integrated as the second level, frame, uh, second level cache for, for Hibernate. So your application will not be changed. It's just a matter of configuration. You're just adding this configuration saying, hey, you use this embedded uh, the cache, now you use the Hazelcast cache. And in this case, you can scale your cache independently from, uh, from your application. <laughs> Distributed computing. Once the data already in your cache and in, in, already in your store, in memory store, it would be wasteful to bring the data to do some computation somewhere else. You need to, uh, you're putting the network down because you need to move a uh, terabyte of data. You um, destroying the client, the like tiny application that needs to read all this data and do some computation. So instead of um, data grids, they allow you to send computation right to your data. So computation will be run inside the grid with close to data. And uh, different, um, different solutions, they provide different way to do data affinity, for example. You can actually stick your uh, execution, your computation, to exact same place where you, your data is. So it's, it's, kind, of, it's kind of nice that, uh, that you, you're not only using this for dump storage when you're just writing some, some stuff but also you can um, do some useful things. And the last, last uh, example is actually very relevant in, in this audience because we see uh, some Java guys, .NET guys, Python guys, JavaScript guys, and uh, essentially all these capabilities that I'm talking about here needs to be available for, for, for any audience, right? It doesn't really matter if you're writing your application in, in Python or in C Sharp. <clears throat> so here's the illustration of the cache as a service. So uh, cache as a service, as I said, is the way how you can integrate different or provide the unified uh, layer of uh, um, data access for your application. And uh, this cache as a service can be essentially um, accessed for many, many uh, different applications in different languages. <clears throat> um, the durability of uh, application data. So very, very good use case that explains this is storing um, shopping cart. You have application that uh, is, is internet store, right? 
and you have your users that go to your store, clicks, uh, adding some, some goods into the shopping cart, and what happens, uh, this machine goes down. In best case scenario, it will be redirected by a load balancer to another live machine, but there is no data because this, this, this um, shopping cart was stored in the session of this machine that went down and you lose your data. In the worst case scenario, you, you, your user will see 404 or 40, uh, 401 or something else. Some, some, some bad thing. So we don't want to have it. We want to have like seamless experience for our, for our users. And the way how we can do um, is to provide, uh, to, to store session data into the format that can be easily replicated. So when the one node goes down, another node will take it over and continue to serve the same data for, for user. Uh, application scalability, very important topic even today because right now we see rise of clouds. We see lots of um, uh, different uh, infrastructure as a service providers, uh, different uh, uh, platform as a service providers, and the like application scalability and elastic application scalability uh, that can, uh, can be achieved. It's also very important and very, uh, I would say, very easy solvable uh, topic with the context of in-memory grids. Um, again, this is an example of uh, cache as a service or database caching. Uh, Hazelcast or any other in-memory grid can be uh, intermediate for um, accessing this data. So business layer will continue to work with key value pattern. It doesn't matter if data comes from the relational database or non-relational database or from some web service. Um, uh, speaking about the scalability and uh, elastic scalability, um, in the cloud, you don't really know where your data is, right? So at some point, you get some idea that you're running on the some machine, but where is actually that is? And if you want to increase the uh, uh, size of your cluster, just throw more machines. And your the gr grid needs to support this. The grid needs to support elastic scalability, scalability of the um, overall uh, overall application and the platform. <clears throat> and when we talk about distributed, uh, distributed computing use case, um, as, as you remember, I mentioned that data is already there. You or your other uh, applications that integrates with, with your data already place this data there. If you need to run some, some, uh, some computation, you need to do some average uh, salary for months per state, Instead of pulling it to somewhere like Hadoop and running it there, um, just run it, run it here, right inside, right inside the grid. Um, in terms of clients, clients needs to be location aware. It would be also not very, not very convenient if clients need to go each and every node and check is the data here, is the data here. Well, you can say, yes, of course, they, they can use uh, the master-slave replication, so they, they will always know that if they need to write, they need to go one slave, uh, the master, if, if you need to read, they go to, uh, to slave. However, again, we're in, the, we're, in the, we're in the cloud, and we wanna make these uh, like generic as possible and elastic as possible. We cannot change client code and cannot change the client configuration each and every time when we're spinning new machine in the cloud. So client needs to be reactive. They need to be reactive to topology change of the cluster. And they need to pick up this configuration in the runtime instead of uh, uh, rewriting the uh, configuration each and every time. So for example, if we do uh, some operations like uh, map.get, we need to go directly to the place where data is stored. And <coughs> the, the support of languages uh, or different languages is very important. So, Many, uh, this is like slide specifically for Hazelcast. Many uh, other, uh, the, the products they provide like similar or uh, similar port of languages. Um, and all this, all this kind of uh, language support, support of different technologies that comes in, in, in open st standard way. Um, open source is a really uh, very interesting thing, and the people who were in proprietary world, they switching to open source, or they open sourcing proprietary software, because 
right now um, developers choosing technologies for 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 um, for products for projects, and they can go to the boss and say, "Hey, I, I I like this technology because I want to go to code and see how this thing is written, and I know that exactly what's going on. I don't want to use this the product that was brought to our company on some I don't know gold field sales deal with IBM or what. I know these guys; they they're credible because they have." Uh, Pretty good, pretty good use, use base, uh, user base. You see that the, the tickets come and go. Um, some bugs arrive. They, they fix it right away. The open source. This is a new thing. And in the in the world of in memory grids, I'll I'll give you just like two examples. For past two years, uh, two companies that were like totally proprietary, they switched to open source model. They just simply just start you know start doing the thing that we did from the very beginning. Um, Hazelcast was open sourced in 2008 when it was started as, as, as a project and it was open source. And all this like language support, they also based on open technology. Uh, open protocols, open binary protocols, it's very important. Uh, specifically for, for Hazelcast, we, we released the open client protocol that allows to allows us super fast introduce a new languages support um, for for, 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 for the grid. Um, any questions so far? Once again, I have two shorts here. I don't want it sounds like a lecture, so I want to hear questions. So how we can make this uh, in-memory data uh, scalable, reliable, durable? So let's talk about um, topology, and I think I'm, I will even run some live stuff, some demos. So let's talk about data distribution, how the data distribution is happens. Two typical data distribution patterns. Who can tell me which one is which? So I will explain what we see in this slide. <laughs> so we have two copies of the same ship, and now we have sort of shredded version of the same ship, it's lamp chops, right? <laughs> or like something like this, okay. So is it replication? Sharding, exactly, yeah. So two typical data distribution patterns. I, I, I like it's like, it's, it, I know this is like very like uh, the, the violent maybe uh, slide, but it actually explains very well. You, 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 never, um, you never forget this, <laughs> so now you have it, now you have it, all right. So replication. With replication, you have a um, total copy of your data uh, on the same, same node or same machine. And if we're going to do like the replication of full data set, our scalability of, uh, of the system will be limited by capabilities of smallest, uh, smallest machine in a cluster, basically. So master-slave replication would be uh, scalable at the point where you can fit your memory in one machine. Um, with sharding, we, we actually using a different approach. We, 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 we transform this data and we putting different chunks of your data in the different places. And um, this, this, uh, these chunks would be read accordingly. So this is also a very important slide because I want to check your attention. You're still with me. It's nothing wrong with my computer. Everything is fine. <laughs> All right, we're still good. Okay, so what? what, what um, I'm going to talk about a little bit about partition right now, and I will do some uh, some examples here. So um, when we t when when we have a data partition, data stored in the uh, the buckets called shards or partition. So in the case of uh, in case of Hazelcast, default partition size is 271. 271 partition. Partition is the, is the chunk, this is the unit of work, unit of data uh, migration, basically. So when we have one node, everything fits in, uh, in the 271 partition. And um, if we don't have, if you will lose this node, we will lose this node, right? If we're adding more nodes, we're adding more capabilities to, to the system. So in this case, we have more room to also introduce backups. 
even though these backups are in memory. So as you can see from, the, from, the, from this, this, this part, the primary data will store, um, it will be shared. Part of this data would be stored in one node, another part will be stored in another one node. And as you can see here, the backup will contain data that's stored in another node. So what happens if we're adding more nodes? We have a better, um, more and more stuff. How, how we on time? Yeah. Five minutes, okay, I need to rush it up. <laughs> All right, so let's do, um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to show you one thing instead of, uh, instead of showing slides. So I will give you this idea about uh, having the backup data in memory uh, and how it works. So instead of doing the slides, I'll really um, do, um, I'll show you, okay, PowerPoint lives its own life, okay. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this one. So what, do I, what I have here right now, instead of showing you in the slides, I'll show you live demo. I have this cluster running on this tiny guy. Um, and as you can see, I have a cluster of three nodes. So data is uh, distributed, data is partitioned, meaning that um, all data more or less evenly spread across, across the cluster. So now, what I'm gonna do here, I'm gonna populate this cluster with some data. Um, so in this case, I switch to, um, to my, my client. It's just a simple console application that allows me to do simple puts and gets. Um, namespace, let's, just, let's call it chat devs. So I'm do put mini. Uh, let's do 10,000, 10,000 and size of 1K, right? So as you can see here, I have this uh, data structure called map that essentially uh, supports a key, va uh, key value pattern for accessing this data. I just populated this data with uh, the 10,000 uh, elements. And as you can see, these entries, they spread it. So one node has one third part of, of this full data set. Also, a not, a nodes will have a backups of the data that's stored in another member. So in this case, we also have a backups of this data. So uh, first thing, I will demonstrate uh, what happens if we're adding new member to the cluster. So I simply, um, let me show you what's, how it looks like. Um, so this is a simple script that starts just a one jar. So Java is not that actually bad. There's not the ton of jars. So in this particular case, it's just a one jar and just simple command that starts this uh, the server. That's it. Um, it's very simple and uh, don't need to be afraid. Much simpler than Node. All right, so I have here, ah, I didn't start it, okay. Mm -hmm. Too fast. Okay, server. All right. Now, now I have my uh, cluster in one, two, Three, four, come on, come on. <laughs> Yay! All right, live demo, awesome. So what happens is when I added the new node, the, the cluster went into like very, for a short period of time, it went to a situation called migration. So in this case, cluster will be rebalanced, the partition would be moved, and now um, we still have, I will show you a very nice picture on the home screen that, um, that shows the uh, distribution of the partitions. So now see, we still have each and every member has pretty much uh, equal amount of partitions, uh, equal number of partitions. And now, particular node will hold a little bit less because we sort of increase the ca uh, capacity of this cluster, right? So we increase the capacity of the cluster and uh, as you can see, uh, we have still, still uh, 10,000 uh, 10, elements and uh, everything's good. Everything's good when everything's good, but sometimes, it's not that good, and we have one member of the cluster went down. So management center will update this information in two. <laughs> ha, 
that's faster. All right, so now what we will see right now, we still will have the same number, just give, uh, give it a second. So management center has like a couple seconds delay uh, between, um, uh, between updates. So information, actually the cluster already changed the, the, the migration thing. Um, no, it doesn't, it breaks something. I guess it's the, um, because I'm using multicast here. But it will, it will restore itself uh, pretty quickly, I believe. Yeah, I love it when this happens. So let's talk about theory in this case. <laughs> All right. Sometimes, you know, live demos are live demos. Um, network is network. Okay, so we already seen this, how the things happened with uh, distribution. So let's talk about crash. Uh, you saw in real life how the data distribution works in the, in, in the best case scenario. In the worst case scenario, we're losing one node, and now we need to, uh, we need to restore this data. When I told, told you about the backups, the backups after, after node will be crashed. Um, backups will contain data that was essentially stored in the primary partition of this guy. So and after that, the backups will be propagated and backups will be, um, backups will be a, um, the primary primary data, and after that we um, to answer your question about uh, consistency. Uh, who, who asked a question about consistency? Yeah. So um, to preserve data consistency in case of migration, we limiting uh, writes at the moment of migration. So we your put will be uh, will be placed on hold. So when on your application when you do the put, you will you will see like lag sort of. You will wait. So we're doing this to preserve data consistency because during migration, um, the, the partitions, they are in two states. In the previous state, to preserve uh, topology and support um, um, clients that didn't know yet about changing of topology. And the new state, but this new state didn't send the acknowledge yet, so it would be like transactional migration. So this is why we're not allowing to write, but we're allowing to read in this case. So in, this, in case of partition, in this particular case, we, um, we sort of, um, not sort of, we, we, we're preserving uh, data consistency. Yeah, in, in, uh, in a very, uh, in, in the good reliable network like uh, gigabit network, it's very fast. It only d depends on the size of your data, how much data you store in the Hazelcast. Uh, or in the grid in, in general. So uh, in, in, in Hazelcast use case, it can, be, uh, it can be tweakable. If you have like very big cluster of data, you probably want to have a uh, bigger number of partitions, so you want to make them smaller because, like I said, partitions are unit of migration of data. You, your data not migrating itself. The, the, the storage, these buckets where you store your data, partitions will be migrated. If they, you, you make them very big, it will take more time to migrate them. If you make them relatively small, or you, if you make them small, so in this case, they will not, not able to fit a lot of data. So in this case, you need to find this trade-off, depends on the size of your data set that you're putting there, um, obviously network. But in, in, in practice, this, um, this situation like happens so in a in couple seconds, even less. Um, we were in very big data sets. That's an awesome question. Just keep it for a second. What size of T-shirt? You asked for about consistency, right? Yes. You? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I didn't have my lunch. I'm sorry. <laughs> question about the backups. So, how many backups you can have? So, uh, Hazelcast has a configuration that allows to configure um, up to six backups. Backups can be synchronous and asynchronous. What does, what's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous? With synchronous backups, at the time when you write data in primary partition, another thread will write it into backup partition, and everything's gonna happen in one call from, from, from your application perspective. This is synchronous backup. If you need to have um, just write, and after that, another thread will, hold, uh, will bring the, uh, the backup um, as asynchronously, so in this case, the write will be fast, Backup will be will be will be handled uh, in the background, um, up to six. Meaning that, in the uh, seven member cluster configuration, you can have each node has its own the backup of the data that's stored in another node. 
yeah. Um, in the bigger clusters, yeah, it makes sense to have more backups uh, if you want to preserve data resiliency. Okay, just uh, let me scroll here. Yeah. So this is uh, the the typical use case of um, scaling out, right? So we're scaling out our application. We have really big machine. For example, we have, um, I don't know, hundreds of gigabytes of RAM on the machine. We can run multiple Java processes in this case. Um, but in this case, each and every process will, 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 will face its own problem. We sort of scaling out, like in my machine. I'm starting more processes. They uh, represent the separate node of Hazelcast cluster. We, we scaling out. We're creating sort of a similar uh, cluster node. But what if, I'll skip this one, but if we want to have um, the scaling up, we have like a really big machine. We have like, a, I don't know, like one terabyte of uh, RAM machine. And we don't want to spend uh, or start multiple uh, processes there. We just want to want to have one, um, one process that holds all this data. The problem, what we're trying to solve here, because we're running in Java, we depend on heap. Uh, we cannot just make the heap as big as, as our RAM, because in this case, the Java application will create a zillion of objects, and they will um, pollute this uh, heap, even though you know, they would be eventually released by garbage collector. And the garbage collector in this case is, is causing the problem because garbage collector, the way how it works in Java, it's actually stop of the world. So it stops all threats until it will, you know, clean up all, all garbage. And sometimes in very big uh, heaps and very big data sets, this pause can take up to a minute. Uh, easy. I just, uh, uh, last, um, last week I, I went for the clients and they, they actually created a heap for like 25 gigabytes, uh, two nodes, and uh, they're putting like lots of stuff there. And after that, they say, oh, our clustering is falling apart. Yeah, because of the garbage collection pause, it took like one second. And during the time, um, the threads that's supposed to be sending the um, heartbeats to each other, they didn't reply because they were placed on hold because of garbage collection. So now, uh, when we actually, with high density memory store, we can actually allocate memory physical memory, physical RAM, outside of uh, access of garbage collection. So in this case, this, like a beefy machine can be used in full. You can use it for storage, everything in memory, but it will not be affected by um, but garbage collection pause. And there's some statistics that I did um, in, uh, in uh, some of the uh, projects for the clients. Essentially, it's a, it's a two use cases, both have uh, they need to address like four gigabytes of, 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 of data. Uh, they need to use like four gigabytes of data. In this case, it doesn't use any like off heap storage that everything stores inside the heap. So in this case, garbage collection uh, pauses took up to, five, up to five seconds. So to put it into perspective, um, you have very tight SLA of your clients. And you need to reply, like you, 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 you're developing some API application that does payment. And you have a SLA that your uh, payment will be processed in, in, in hundreds of milliseconds, like bottom line. And now you have a five, um, five seconds pause because of the garbage that might be, um, um, might be available in the application. And you, you probably can, you can, uh, you know, use the better side of programming, like clean up resources. Some very crazy people, they actually do their own build of JVM with disabled garbage collection, and after that, they have enough uh, capacity to do like a, a eight hours run, and after that, they're restarting these machines, some, some other stuff. And with, like, if you have like a tight SLA, but you don't have engineers that can hack in JVM, um, in this case, the, 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 for, for that kind of use case, we designed this uh, high density store. So we just use like a small piece of heap, just only important stuff inside the heap because like a Java, um, a Hazelcast application is a Java application, so it needs to run on heap. But the storage itself, storage itself would be outside. And we get uh, like pretty impressive results. The minor pauses will happen, but they like very minor and they will be unnoticeable in most cases. And the last thing that I want to uh, um, talk, do we really uh, want to have, do you really 
need uh, NoSQL, plus it would be nice to have NoSQL with, uh, in memory speed, right? And uh, there is a company called Zero Turnaround. They're running very nice uh, blog about technologies called Rebel Labs. So they're doing this uh, survey for developers and they're collecting this information and in 2000, I guess it's 2014 data. So when they did, um, when they did this survey for, uh, for NoSQL technology, so there's a couple, um, uh, we have a Mongo as a leader, Cassandra, also Java application by the way. Uh, how many of you are using Cassandra here? Anyone, Cassandra? Okay, um, Redis, anyone, Redis? You need to stay, I need to talk to you after. Okay, and uh, we still have a Hazelcast there, right? So the people use Hazelcast because of the uh, key value storage uh, capabilities plus, um, plus uh, ability to query data and actually it fits very well in their use case. They have a uh, the speed, um, speed of in-memory and they have um, NoSQL uh, type of access. Now, I hope after this you a little bit increase your understanding of in-memory data grid. Once again, in-memory data grid, it's in-memory storage. So it's in-memory database. It's in-memory computing platform. Allows you to run computation next to your data that you already uh, have in your, um, in your, in your storage. In-memory messaging. In, in NoSQL database. Now you have it. I hope it was useful for you. I hope you enjoyed the food. I still have uh, run three, four, five, five t-shirts. I owe you one. Uh, what size? Yes, I do. I'm not gonna throw it this time. <laughs> I tried. It, it, it went went wrong. Yeah. So no. All right. Um, anyone questions? T-shirts. Yeah. Uh, you want to use microphone, so the online guys will also. Uh, Share. Uh... So if, if we want strong consistency the, with this, and so we choose the synchronous backup method, um, how, how does that respond to network partitions, particularly like maybe during a write, um, you've already written the two replicas, you have two more and you have a partition, is there a way to roll back and to, to keep that consistent? Uh, I don't, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly. So it's, um, so backup replicas, they not, uh, you not, you don't have access directly to the backup replicas. So you actually only like working with, uh, you know, putting stuff, reading stuff, and that's it. Backup will be handled by, uh, by Hazelcast. And, yeah. 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 So, so in the face of a, a partition, then you would choose to, or Hazelcast would choose to wait in order to, like, it would pr prevent, queue the writes or prevent the writes. So the backup synchronization happens after uh, when we synchronize the primary uh, partitions. So it will be some uh, time the backup will catch up, even though there was some, you know, if because of network partition or because of you lost some node, um, some of the backup may be lost. So backups will be recreated eventually. If, so if you if have this situation when uh, node goes down. So if um, in a partition, if we have conflicting rights to the same piece of data on both sides of the partition, how do we handle? So this is awesome question. So um, in uh, Hazelcast, uh, what size of t-shirt? Uh, medium. medium, sweet, I have one. Um, the, the, the way how, it, how it's done in Hazelcast, we provide the different flavors of API to, to solve. Um, we, you can actually do 
uh, how it's called, pessimistic locking. You can explicitly lock on particular key, and only after you release it, everyone will see this change and will do the, the change that they will see uh, immediately. Uh, but they will not be able to 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 do at least like the lock is there. Uh, there is a optimistic uh, locking as well. So in case of uh, it's sort of like a replace like approach, you have a old value, you have new value. If we're able to write this kind of stuff, uh, we will send you, yes, it's true. If it's not, we will retry until uh, we will be able to. So it's not, exp ex it, it, there's no explicit lock. It's just a, um, um, a compare swap type of thing. Also, we support um, if you need to have multiple changes between multiple data sets we support transaction. You can open a uh, transaction and the all operation that you execute inside transaction there would be serializable. So it, from perspective of um, it's all or nothing. Everything would be written. If there is some conflict, uh, the, everything would be rolled back. We support two types of transaction. You can have like the, the classic two-phase commit where we have all notification. First of all, you send notification. Are you guys ready for, for commit? Everyone says, yes, we're ready. Now we're committing. Uh, we support one-phase transactions, so we're saying, okay, just do the thing. And if it fails, who cares? If it dies, it dies from Rocky. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it, there's a different ways uh, to, um, to do the same thing. Even though, like, simple puts can be... Um, with, is, uh, with a little bit relaxed consistency. If we're using asynchronous puts, for example, um, in this case, when you do put a sync, next call maybe not be ready to read the same value because it was, will be asynchronous, but it, it, was, it was done intentionally. Um, and uh, um, also, where's the Redis, guys? So <laughs> this is very nice stuff that uh, Redis doesn't have. So um, the, in Hazelcast, we have this concept of entry processor. So typically, if you need to change something in Redis, you need to read it from Redis, change something, and write it back. So that's why you're asking this question. How we preserve uh, um, consistency in this case? Do we need to log or how, how we need to do this? So in Hazelcast, we do a uh, different thing. We have an entry processor that will be executed on the same thread that modifies this data. So when you say entry processor, it contains Sophisticated. You can put lots of logic there, how you want to change the data and stuff. So instead of reading data, changing, put it back, entry processor will go there and change data for you. And this is atomic, and this is the right way to, to do without any explicit locking. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. Three to go, huh? Yeah, that's that's a very good question. So, um, the, for online guys, the question was about um, how, like, the running on the JVM or, or running on VM and Paxos, right? The question was how, how we can run. Um, so, obviously, additional layer of um, indirect access to hardware will increase um, some of the um, some of the performance metrics. But essentially, Hazelcast runs inside JVM. We really don't care about where we're running. It can be run on different operation system. Cluster can be run. Different nodes can be run on different operation system. Cluster nodes can be run either on hardware or it can be run in the virtual, um, in the virtual world. Only one thing that, that actually causes huge pain in, uh, in VMs, specifically in uh, VMware world. So when they do backup, they do same thing as the garbage collection do. They, they do stop of the world. So in, in some cases, when they, when they do backup of this virtual machine, it can, you know, freezes everything and this node might fall from the cluster. There's a ways how to prevent this. Yeah, we have a um, split brain resolver. So essentially, um, it's, 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 it's also like very sp split brainish uh, type of thing that happens. Um, there's no like direct answer to your question. Yes, it, 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 it will affect. There's some things need to be kept in mind, but it, many of our clients, they run in, in, uh, in virtual, virtual machines, uh, absolutely fine. And I'm not gonna give you a second t-shirt. I, I, can, I can give you. <laughs> 
All right. Um, yeah. Thanks, guys. It was very nice. Uh, do we have uh, results? Did you? All right. And it's a good thing that we didn't see this picture, right, uh, in, this, in this audience. So you, you, were, you were engaged. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much. Um, thanks for your time. I really enjoyed talking to you. Yeah, thank internet. You. Hi, internet. Yeah, you can be around for a few minutes if people want to chat, right? Huh? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah, yeah I'll. If you want to chat some more, like, stick around, come on up, chat your heart out. Uh, everybody else, if you need to head back to work, thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you.